Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Ashwin Tamankar. I'm a consultant Euro Oncology and Robotic Surgery at Apollo Hospitals, Navi Mumbai. I work as a part of Surgical Oncology Division. So, if you know, we have discussed about bladder cancer in the last session and this particular session is a second session in sync with it in which we are going to discuss about muscle invasive bladder cancer. Just to quickly reiterate what we spoke last time, uh, we discussed about non-muscle invasive bladder cancers wherein the cancerous tissue inside the bladder lumen doesn't reach until the muscle layer which is a uh, main important layer of the bladder function. So in these situations when there is a non-muscle invasive bladder cancer we generally aim to preserve the bladder as much as possible and manage that particular cancer in the early stages. Today we are going to focus on those cancers which are going to the muscle layer of bladder cancer. So one thing which we have to understand is about a very small percentage of tumors in the bladder are diagnosed upfront with muscle invasion that meaning in situ muscle invasion but majority of these cancers actually turn from non-muscle invasive state to muscle invasive state because of progression because of the aggressive nature of the disease of the cancer so overall management for both upfront upfront detected muscle invasive cancers versus a progress cancer to muscle invasive from non-muscle invasive phase by and large the management stays the similar way outcomes may vary a little so in 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 all probability if we see that muscle invasive bladder cancer though it is a less common type of variety of a cancer as compared to prostate or kidney cancer it is an aggressive sort of cancer so definitely it needs to be treated uh, as soon as possible normally the conventional norm which we say is timely intervention for these particular tumors is within about six weeks to eight weeks of initial diagnosis wherein we preserve the good opportunity of uh, oncological outcomes after treating that particular patient so again quick two two important factors which are relevant for bladder cancer in general and they are definitely relevant for etiopathogenesis of muscle invasive bladder cancer one is smoking and second important is environmental exposure to certain chemicals and there are a lot of genes which are involved into these phases the science is evolving the evidence is getting robust and robust as of now we are not uh, contemplating genetic testings for bladder cancer that often but probably another decades time we will have more uh, answer to this particular bit so smoking and environmental exposure of chemicals these are the two important factors which are relevant here so now how do we manage this particular cancer which is going to the muscle firstly muscle invasion is proven uh, or kind of initially speculated based on the imaging which is either a ct scan or an mri of the bladder which tells us about possibility of muscle invasion about the size of the lesion about the location of the lesion and most importantly once we reset that tissue from inside as an initial step which is called as t or bt for which we spoke last uh, in the last session uh, pathologist is going to tell us that this particular cancer is going to the muscle layer of the bladder. So once it goes to the muscle layer and it is proven on the pathological specimen, uh, we, firstly we have to rule out a spread to distant body parts by which I mean we need to image the chest of the patient to evaluate and obviously the abdomen of the patient by doing a CT scan to rule out any further spread. If there is any further spread to distant body parts, obviously our intention of treatment is going to be control. I will discuss that bit in the end. If there is no spread of a cancer into different body parts and it is limited only to the bladder, our intention of treatment is aiming towards cure. So what all are the options in front of an individual having diagnosed with muscle invasive bladder cancer? Generally these are twofold. Most important option is surgical removal of the entire bladder which is called as a radical cystectomy. And the second option is combination of concurrent uh, resection of the tumor from inside followed by chemotherapy and a radiation therapy only very selective group of patients are eligible for this particular uh, modality of treatment unfortunately in India people do not understand the consequences of outcomes cancer profile wise or oncological outcome wise and they invariably uh, get confused be between these two options so a very select group of patient is eligible for these radiation and bladder preservation therapies for muscle invasive bladder cancer. There are a lot of contraindications to it. I'm not going in very technical details of it. But for a tumor which is multifocal, for a tumor which is large in size, which is going to the 
opening of the ureters which also has some other potential uh, changes in the bladder cancer wall or that individual who is not eligible for chemotherapy all these individuals and any other individual diagnosed with muscle invasive bladder cancer are eligible for the complete removal of the bladder which is called as a radical cystectomy so let's discuss about radical cystectomy in next few minutes uh, it's a gold standard approach for muscle invasive bladder cancer management meaning you are completely removing the bladder and the lower ends of the ureter that is the, these are the openings or the tubes which are coming from the kidneys to the bladder you are also removing the prostate in the same specimen in gentlemen and upper third of the urethra in females so that's the entire spectrum of the surgery in addition to the bladder removal we do an extensive lymph node dissection because lymph nodes are the areas where the bladder cancer cells primarily reach as the first level of spread from the local area. So, if entire specimen is sent for pathological examination and pathologist tells us about the details about the, uh, the, the nature of the disease, they, they tell us about the status of the lymph nodes and some extra additional aggressive risk factors, etc, etc. So, if you can understand, once we remove the bladder, there has to be a channel which needs to be formed for someone to pass urine. That is called as urinary diversion. So urinary diversion primarily can be of two fold. One is an external diversion and another is an internal diversion. External diversion is also called as ileal conduit and internal diversion is also called as neobladder. Both these modalities are parallel to each other. Both these modalities have certain consequences uh, and in and out thorough discussion has to happen with an individual preoperatively to decide about uh, the, the way that particular individual would want to have the urinary diversion that done. Um, in general, these are major surgeries which needs a good comprehensive care, a good comprehensive support in terms of ICU support, a dedicated nurse who can look after the stoma, the it, out, outside diversion will form a, a small intestinal portion into the tummy of the patient and that is called a stoma that needs to be taken care of well. There will be a bag attached to it so both these internal or external divergence are basically a form of intestinal patches which we isolate from the normal intestinal continuity we re-establish uh, re, re, uh, the intestinal continuity as a part of the procedure and the isolated segment of the bowel is refashioned or reconfigured into a form of either an external divergence in the form of tube which opens on the tummy or an internal pouch which forms which is attached to the urethra for allowing patient to pass urine from the normal urinary passage and both the ureters or the openings of the kidneys are joined into a, a new joint is created into these openings of the intestine either it can be an external or an internal diversion so quality of life is an important pillar of radical cystectomy it's a major surgery it comes with certain quality of life issues in the post-operative phase so thorough counseling needs to be discussed with the patient a thorough evaluation needs to be done pre-operatively and then a dedicated stoma stoma support or a stoma nurse support needs to be given to the patient for long term most important aspect is the how are these surgeries performed which way these surgeries are performed so conventionally these surgeries are performed in an open manner where you have a cut to the abdomen from starting from the belly button or just above the belly button to the lowermost level uh, of the abdomen and the alternative to this is either a laparoscopic surgery or a robotic surgery both these laparoscopic or robotic surgery avail the opportunities of minimal invasive surgery i'm going to talk about robotic procedure for these particular cystectomy procedures so robotic cystectomy is um, basically it started in probably year 2010 and it's been a decade of improvement in these surgeries if you want to know the statistics about it probably in the western countries nearly one third of the cystectomies are being performed robotically uh, these days or probably around 40 percent in uk or european countries are performed with the robot these days uh, india is not lacking behind we can utilize these robotic surgeries for bladder cancer removal surgeries as these surgeries are extensive in nature, as we can have minimal access approach to the patient, we have good opportunity for that particular patient to have faster recovery, relatively painless recovery, 
early discharge that the difference between the robotic and an open approach for length of stay meaning the hospital stay is about two to three days possible less of minor complications or we call it grade three complications less of blood transfusions less of blood loss and faster rapid recovery there is a terminology called eras we, uh, the full form of that is enhanced recovery after surgery these are the protocols which we follow in both open manner or open surgeries or robotic surgeries wherein we give some agents for the or, or utilize some protocols standardized protocols for patient to recover faster after these particular surgery so these so, uh, eras protocols come as a standard part of these cystectomy procedures talking about the chemotherapy after surgical removal few patients may need surgical removal of the bladder few patients may need chemotherapy post operatively or if we have a, an intuition that the cancer cell uh, is coming to the external layer of the bladder wall in the imaging on the ct scan we majority of the times give chemotherapy before the surgery that is called as new adjuvant chemotherapy so addition of a chemotherapy to the surgical removal of the bladder gives good amount of survival advantage at 5 years for these patient to the tune of about 5 to 8%. So in general these surgeries are major surgeries but they are absolutely required and relevant for having a better cancer related outcomes for these particular patients. This particular message has to be conveyed across the groups because in Indian scenario majority of the times people are uh, afraid of getting the bladder removal but that doesn't translate into good outcome for cancer control in long run because neither the quality of life stays good in the end stage of the bladder cancer where the disease goes to different body parts nor the cancer related survival stays better if we do not do anything at the right point of time at right junction so most important is whenever it is necessary it has to be done and that's the only good opportunity for an individual to stay healthy for long run out of this particular cancer as i mentioned this cancer is a relatively aggressive cancer so as i mentioned if there is any spread of a cancer to different body parts in the initial evaluation which we are going to do for the particular patient then the role of complete removal of the bladder is not uh, robust or that is not uh, justified at that point of time because the cancer is already spread to different body parts hence early diagnosis early reporting of your symptoms early reporting of uh, blood in the urine is a very essential pillar of diagnosis of this particular cancer at an early juncture whenever there is a spread of a cancer to different body parts medical oncologists generally manage these particular individuals by giving either chemotherapies and recently there is a big role of immunotherapy which is coming to picture for especially for these bladder cancers which are uh, giving good functional good oncological outcomes for long term control uh, for these particular patients so just to summarize what we spoke today bladder cancer muscle invasive cancer of a bladder is an aggressive cancer it needs a good team effort or a multidisciplinary team effort which involves multiple specialties surgical speciality radiation team medical oncologist pathologist radiology team or a, a, a nuclear medicine department which images the patient at different occasions so that's a comprehensive team effort or we call it multidisciplinary team effort for managing a particular individual radical cystectomy meaning complete removal of the bladder is essential in the phase when the muscle invasive cancer is proven and the cancer cell is already gone to the muscle layer of the bladder uh, it is a major surgery but definitely an essential surgery it can be done in an open laparoscopic or a robotic manner Minimal invasive surgeries gave us an advantage of faster recovery, painless recovery and an early discharge for the patient. Urinary divergence can be either an external or internal diverge, diversion. Everything needs to be discussed with the patient. All the pros and cons need to be discussed with the patient thoroughly in the preoperative setting for understanding the patient's expectations and deciding about the type of diversion. Quality of life aspects are very much important after the surgical removal of the bladder and uh, there is a good role of a stoma care and a stoma nursing staff in this particular segment so what i would suggest is definitely do not ignore your symptoms any episode of blood in urine has to be reported for an early diagnosis of a cancer and uh, thank you so much